Okay. We'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, I can see from the list of people that are joining that uh, a good handful of you have joined some prior uh, virtual field tours that we've done this year. So this is the seventh of nine virtual field tours that we've hosted this year or will be hosting. And uh, definitely want to acknowledge all of our sponsors. There's a lot of um, a lot of people working together uh, to make all these virtual field tours happening and a bunch of different um, uh, uh, funding and support opportunities that have come that um, have enabled us to do this work. So uh, thank you. So today's the virtual field tour is on uh, our squash variety trials. And uh, the Dry Farming Institute helped to raise money to purchase our seed this year. And um, SeedLinked is another, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that during our, our virtual field tour. It's a tool that we're piloting to help with our data collection and to enable more participation. So a little outline of what we're gonna be covering today. Uh, we're gonna to talk a, a little bit about some prior work that has been done on dry farmed winter squash in our region in the Maritime Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about some results uh, or preliminary data that's been collected from the Oak Creek demonstration site, uh, as well as some variety trials that were done as a part of a, a project with the Northwest Climate Hub from 2016 to 2018 and then highlight some of the work of Alex Stone and, Jen, and Jenny Wetzel. And then uh, we'll talk about, of course, the trials that we're doing this year with Delicata and Maxima uh, squash that are pictured there on the right-hand side. And uh, we'll be highlighting some pictures at, and or video from uh, some of our participating sites this year. And we have about 30 participating sites in the Delicata and Maxima squash trials. And some of them are overlapping, but um, that's, uh, that's a pretty good amount. I think, um, yeah, the, the SeedLink tool is helping us increase participation already. So right here is, um, so in, since tw 2015, we have dry farmed winter squash uh, at the Oak Creek uh, site. So this uh, slide is highlighting the 2016 demonstration. So we have um, 8,000 square feet there. And uh, th on that year, you can see on the bottom left-hand side, we have pictured there's four different beds that are also diagrammed out right above it. And we had an irrigated treatment, a low irrigated treatment, uh, dry farmed and then a dry farmed plot that had a Bokashi biochar compost and we planted out uh, four different crops two varieties of each and that included winter squash you can see down there um, it's on the third from the bottom plot there's winter squash and we included Zeppelin Delicata and Stella Blue and we selected those varieties that year because uh, Zeppelin is a very commonly grown um, variety of winter squash here, a delicata squash that is loved by a lot of, um, uh, it's at the farmer's market, a lot of people love that variety. And then we also tried Stella Blue, which is a dry farmed variety we got from Seed Revolution Now. And you can see those pictured in the bottom right hand corner. The one on the left is the Stella Blue, and then the one on the right is um, the Zeppelin Delicata. And the results are shown in this bar graph uh, right above in the top right corner there. So the red bars are the dry farmed uh, yields. So we got on the left side of the graph, we got pounds per acre. Uh, and if you're a smaller producer, you can see pounds per plant on the right hand side. So the Stella Blue and the dry farm treatment was yielding um, in between 20 and 25 pounds per plant. And the dry farmed uh, Delicata was uh, yielding in between 10 and 15 pounds per plant. So um, interestingly, uh, we see a lot of difference in, in varieties in general uh, it, it, as to how they perform under irrigated and dry farm. So you can see the Stella Blue yields in general are much bigger and the dry farm yield is about half of the irrigated yield. But that wasn't necessarily true for the Delicata. We had more yield from the dry farm plot, 
um, but a much lower yield in general. So um, we are doing a lot of variety trials with the Dry Farming Collaborative because we notice so many uh, differences in how the different varieties within each crop respond. So this is why we choose to continue this work because we always see these, uh, these effects of, in varieties. So the Dry Farming Collaborative is a, a, if you're not familiar or already a part of that group, we're a group of growers and researchers, plant breeders, um, there's gardeners and farmers in the group, different ag professionals, all partnering to increase knowledge and awareness of dry farming with a very hands-on participatory approach. So um, our Facebook group has over 900 members now. I think we're maybe around 950. And this is a active discussion forum where people share pictures and videos, ask questions, what varieties work well. So there's a lot of information exchange that happens there. And then we also have an email list for trial hosts. So those are the folks that are actively engaging in our research and participating uh, in uh, some of our uh, variety trials and other research projects. So the, we did variety trials with the Dry Farming Collaborative from 2016 to 2018. And this work was uh, funded by the USDA Northwest Climate Hub. And you can see pictured there several varieties, uh, four varieties that we grew across multiple sites that year. And you can see on the bottom right hand side, the kind of schematic of what one plot looked like. So growers opted to, if they had a small amount of space, they may have just allocated 100 square feet to participate and grow one replication of a variety, or they may have grown one replication of each variety. So that schematic shows what one rep looked like. It would be three squash plants spread out uh, in a 100 square foot plot. And you can see uh, the North Georgia candy rooster. When you go over here and look at the graph, um, this is this um, giant pink banana squash. Uh, and it definitely has stood out in yields. And you can see kind of the average here for this variety is in the around 25 pounds per plant. So just to kind of get an idea, like as we show more data uh, and information throughout this plot, kind of a high yield for a squash per plant might be in the 25 or 20 to 30 range, maybe 25. And then a lower yield is like 10 pounds or less per plant. Um, and then the, uh, these other varieties. So by the way, the, um, it's important to note that these varieties weren't just selected randomly. Uh, you'll see in a moment that um, uh, the North Georgia Candy Roaster came from, we selected that variety based on Alex Stone and Jenny Wetzel's work. Uh, Winter Sweet was another one that we selected because of Alex and Jenny's work. Hidatsa was reported to do well dry farmed by some farmers in the Dry Farming Collaborative. So that one was uh, chosen by the growers. And Stella Blue is one of the varieties that we were able to uh, source from a plant breeder um, and a farmer that selects in dry farm systems. So those were how those varieties were selected. So Alex Stone and Jenny Wetzel, I invited them to participate today, but they uh, have other things going on. So we're not going to go into a great amount of detail about their work, um, but I am just going to highlight where some of the information we're highlighting is coming from. Um, so down here at the bottom, uh, so they put out a uh, summarized a lot of their work in this journal article in Hort Science. So yield response of winter squash to irrigation regime and planting density. And um, they were looking at dry farm versus irrigated squash, multiple varieties. And then Jenny's um, master's thesis was uh, this project, the effect of irrigation and storage environment on winter squash storage loss losses. So you'll see in a second that we're, uh, they were find had some finding, they stored squash after harvest and looked at um, the storage life of these squash. And um, this website at the very top, eatwintersquash.com, uh, their kind of project slogan was putting the winter back in winter squash because a lot of winter squash in our area is typically rots in storage, um, you know, before winter a lot of the time. So they were looking at varieties that um, uh, have 
good culinary uh, characteristics that store well, have disease resistance, and then they were looking at ones that also uh, perform well dry farmed. So this slide is just a good visual of um, the varieties that they say do well uh, dry farmed in the Willamette Valley uh, based on their um, study results. And they were looking at yield, storage ability, soil borne disease resistance, and culinary qualities. And you can see some of the ones that we've already kind of um, been introduced to in this presentation. This North Georgia candy roaster has been a standout variety as far as yield. Uh, Silver Bell also, um, you'll hear Lucas talking about that one a little bit. It's included in this year's variety trials. Um, there's also Winter Sweet, which you uh, saw on some previous slides. Uh, this Tetsu Kabuto is one that is also included this year. And then you can see down in the bottom corner, there's the Zeppelin Delicata. So it's the one Delicata squash that was, um, uh, that did well dry farmed in their trials. The one that was included that I'm aware of. So this slide is highlighting the effect of variety. Um, so this was the yield at time of harvest. So across th the three sites that participated in their research project, um, this small wonder uh, is a small spaghetti squash um, that was uh, really high yielding. So um, this is in tons per hectare. So a different unit than what we've been looking at too in pounds per plant. So 45 is a pretty high yield. So that was, um, and then North Georgia Candy Roaster right behind it and Silver Bell. And another variety that I've mentioned in pri prior slides that we're looking at this year is Zeppelin Delicata. So it's a lower yield in general, but uh, Delicatas tend to have lower yields than, um, than the Maxima squash. So this is a slide that's highlighting that Alex, uh, Alex Stone shared with us that highlights their uh, yield throughout the winter. So this slide is, um, uh, might be hard for some of you to see, but I'll just go walk through it a little bit here. So at the top, the top bar graph is um, the yield at harvest. And notice here across the bottom, we have all these varieties listed across. So, um, and then the, the dark colored bar is the irrigated yield and the light colored bar is the dry farmed yield. So you can see the dark uh, at harvest, a lot of the uh, irrigated plots of course are uh, higher than the dry farm plots and that's to be expected. And then in January, which is several months after harvest, you can see some of these, um, you know, these bars are, are dropping down because the, there's been some loss in storage and uh, you can see some, there's uh, definitely some dry farm bars still standing here uh, and some irrigated ones. This uh, Tetsu Kabuto is one that Alex has talked a lot about in her presentations. Um, this variety does well irrigated and it stores well. Uh, but then you get down here into March and you're looking at what's left. Um, you know, this is five months or so after harvest. This, the squash were harvested in probably September, maybe some in early October. And you can see uh, the light colored bars here. There's not very many dark colored bars left in storage at March, in March, but you can see Small Wonder is still standing strong. Uh, the irrigated Tetsu Kabuto is still standing strong, um, but you can see Silver Bell and um, any other sweet mama, a few other varieties. So it's only really um, mostly the dry farm squash left in storage after five or six months. And that's important for market farmers because um, there's kind of the hunger gap, the winter months where there's not a lot um, harvesting, things are growing slower if you are doing winter vegetables. So having some product to sell in the winter months is really important. So some uh, uh, one of the main takeaway messages from Alex and Jenny Works was in general that dry farm squash have a lower yield at harvest, but can store much longer than squash grown under full irrigation. And there's some varietal, varietal exceptions like the Tetsu Kabuto. Um, so some of the top yielding varieties after four months of storage were the dry farmed uh, Small Wonder 
and uh, the red ones are all the dry farmed ones and dry farm north georgia candy roaster and the dry farm silver bell so for 2020 um, for our squash variety trials we had three objectives so we wanted to learn how the three how three commonly grown delicata squash varieties compare under dry farm conditions on multiple dry farming collaborative sites in the maritime pacific northwest and this is also because um, a lot of people love delicata but we've really only looked at zeppelin delicata so far uh, which is grown by wild garden seed and the second objective was also to learn how three Maxima squash varieties that have performed uh, well in prior dry farm trials, how they compare under dry farm conditions on multiple sites. Um, and then the third objective is uh, piloting uh, SeedLinked as a platform for data collection. Um, I think the researchers or the people coordinating the variety trials are often the bottleneck in um, uh, kind of getting this data analyzed and back out to people in a shareable format that kind of compiles the information across sites and SeedLink um, kind of does that automatically in a sense and people can go in on the back side of that platform and see results. So we're excited and hopeful that that can help us broaden our participation. So for the Delicata squash trial, the three varieties that are um, commonly grown here and actually all have some roots in the Willamette Valley, their origination, uh, Honey Boat, uh, we got that from Siskiyou Seeds and that actually came out of uh, OSU breeding, uh, vegetable breeding program, um, Jim Baggett. Uh, candy Stick Dessert Delicata came from Adaptive Seeds and um, just a note for those of you that aren't from um, our area, um, Adaptive Seeds is uh, uh, just in Sweet Home and they were evacuated in the wildfires that happened. So um, just uh, keep them in your thoughts and uh, we're hopeful that, uh, yeah, there's not a huge amount of loss there. Um, so Candy Stick Dessert Del Delicata is an open source seed initi uh, initiative Oh, um, OSSI variety. So um, anyone who grows a variety that's pledged with the Open Seed Source Initiative, um, you know, they're sharing um, those genetics. They're, they can't be patented. Uh, so they're freely available for people that want to work with and develop varieties. Zeppelin is also an Open Seed Source Initiative uh, variety from Wild Garden Seed. So these all, uh, each of these three varieties are uh, grown uh, in the state of Oregon and uh, were even developed within the state of Oregon. So our protocol for the squash variety trials, um, we sent out um, seeds that were purchased by the Dry Farming Institute uh, to those who wanted to participate via our, e we, we kind of communicated via our email list and people um, were like, yeah, I'd like to host, uh, you know, one uh, as a small grower, I'd like to host one replication of each or I have room to host three replications of each variety. So we sent out those seeds uh, along with some protocol and most people I think transplanted and uh, others that chose to direct seed um, later in the month of May when the soil temps were a little warmer. I know that uh, I've had more luck transplanting because the cool wet soil temps um, definitely uh, impact germination and I think I'm a little too eager maybe uh, and plant too early often when I've tried direct seeding uh, cucurbits like squash. Um, but some people have really good luck direct seeding. Maybe they're more patient than I am. Um, so we use row cover or we recommend using row cover after um, planting because cucumber beetles are a huge problem and can come in and uh, annihilate a crop overnight uh, or over a weekend as I've discovered before. Um, and we are not irrigating. So of course the transplants are irrigated in the greenhouse before they're planted, but we're not applying any irrigation in the field because we are of course trying to evaluate how these different varieties do without irrigation or dry farmed in our area. And uh, diligent weed man management, of course. So you can see on this uh, middle picture, this is May 20th, and um, these are beans actually in the center, but back here is um, Brad and Maricos, our student research assistants, um, transplanting uh, winter squash. 
So these are the little starts um, planted late May here. And uh, you can see we have three plants per plot. And uh, interestingly enough, there's actually two plants there in each plot that we intended to thin. Um, but we didn't. So this is um, this plot has like a double planting. It's like two plants in each spot. So six plants per hundred square feet. So we'll have, it'll be interesting to see what the effect is there. So this is a little more about seed linked. So um, I got connected with uh, Nico, who is um, the developer, one of the developers of this platform. Um, it, he's based out of Wisconsin. So I was at the Organic Seed Growers Conference this past winter and was at a presentation and I got so excited about the potential for um, using this to um, expand our participation and uh, have more open source data. So in this platform, you can kind of see it pictured here. This is, um, this is uh, I pulled up my profile here and the projects I'm working on. So they got the delicata squash varieties here. And then uh, we entered in the planting date. So when we seeded the squash, when we transplanted, and then once we um, start harvest, we'll enter first harvest date here and then last harvest date here. Although I think we'll be harvesting all at once. Um, and I've entered um, all of them germinated uh, very well, although I know some of the growers uh, the participating have um, sent me messages saying, yeah, they didn't get great germination. I know there's been a lot of rodent uh, pressure this year for whatever reason, mild winter perhaps last year. Uh, and then as we um, go through and harvest, I'll be filling up the different, um, the rest of the parameters. So we'll be looking at uh, we've already already taken notes on vigor, um, but disease resistance, insect resistance, uh, earliness, appearance, flavor, marketability, yield, and storage. So with each of those um, qualitative, you know, you're just, we're ranking these on a scale from one to five, and you can also enter a comment, like if there was a particular insect, like, you know, cucumber beetle or whatever it is, or rodent um, pressure, you could enter notes in about that. So, and then the beautiful thing about this platform is after you finish your trial and hit complete trial, which is that button at the top, you can go then in, in the back and see what everybody else um, entered. And then you can also see where everyone else is from. You can see um, we're mostly spread throughout here, Western Washington and Oregon, but maybe someday that'll be a global map and we'll be uh, looking more broadly and participating in trials with folks in other, in other regions of the world. So I am gonna show you some pictures of one of our plots. So in this, uh, at the start of this video, there's some tomato plants, but this is just a, a walk through um, July 3rd of the plot at the Oak Creek Center for Urban Horticulture in Southwest Corvallis. Let's see here. So these are tomatoes in the adjacent plot. That's our temp, um, humidity and temperature uh, logger, so we can keep track of the different conditions on our sites. And here you can see, this is what our plants looked like right after we pulled that row cover off in, in early July. So um, as I mentioned before, each one of those plants is actually a double plant on this site because I never had time to thin. So um, we will see how that does. Um, this next video is gonna be uh, somewhat redundant to some of the other things I said, but we recorded this in mid-July and it is just kind of highlighting, um, it's July 13th, I believe, that we recorded this video and it's just talking about the trials, me talking about the trials at that Oak Creek site. So this video is captured two weeks after the video that I just showed after we pulled that row cover off. So um, we'll just give this a look and Sorry about that. I'm going to go back. All right, here we go. I'm 
I'm standing in our delicata, delicata squash variety trial and there are 27 sites uh, participating, the Dry Farming Collaborative. So um, we're trialing uh, three different varieties of delicata squash this year, which include Zeppelin, Honey Boat, and Candy Stick. These are varieties that are commonly grown on market, um, on farms that are direct marketing. You see them at the farmer's market a lot. Um, but a lot of folks don't know how they perform in a dry farm system. So that's what we're hoping to learn about this year. And one of the other interesting things that we're doing this year with this trial is we're piloting an app called Seedlinked as a means to uh, collect data. And um, it's a pretty user-friendly platform that growers will be submitting information on um, what date they planted, uh, how did they germinate, um, how productive are they, uh, disease resistance, and a few other parameters. So we'll be using that platform to compile our data and then share about that um, this winter. Um, behind me, um, you can see uh, there's not a lot of difference in these different varieties. They all look pretty good right now here in mid-July. And um, I can tell you that there's a lot of flowers and fruit set happening. A lot of bees humming around here and um, one of the things interesting that about this site is that um, I forgot to thin there are actually uh, two plants in each location we transplanted these in early May and I put two seeds in each pot and I intended to go back and thin them and they never got thin so uh, this site will be interesting to compare to the sites where they did thin um, to see how that impacts productivity. So we'll have more to share at the end of the growing season and um, we'll be featuring this in our virtual field tours as well. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. And I'm just going to pan for the viewers just so they can see a little bit of context of where we are at the Oak Creek site that is also shared with other projects and research for joining us here today. All right, so um, this is uh, just some more photos of what that plot looked like over time. So that video is mid-July. So here we are on the left photo, you can see end of July, the squash there. And then on the right, the end of August. So the dry beans that are adjacent to the squash are ready for harvest there in that photo. And then you can see early September, those beans adjacent have been harvested and the squash are starting to dry down. And then the photo on the right is, um, I stopped by to check on things, but as a lot of you know, we've had a lot of wildfire and um, the air quality here has been pretty poor, which you can visibly see there. So we would have harvested that week and have that data to share, but um, we're kind of waiting for respirators to arrive so that we can um, safely work outside. So the great news is that we, um, we have other participants that have shared pictures of their sites today. And um, I so um, Cassandra Maricos Brad, uh, in our participant list, you should see Bill and Carol Sudkiss. They're here. Would you mind uh, unmuting them so they could maybe share a little bit about their experience dry farming and their results if they'd like? So it looks like it's merging audio, so it might take a few minutes. Um, okay. Carol, let me know if that works or um, let me know in the chat. Okay, great. I'll um, give that just a minute here. So Carol and Bill have participated in uh, dry, our dry farming collaborative trials for the past few years, and um, they're located in Salem, Oregon. So they sent along these pictures last week. Um, they planted mid-May, so about five days before we planted out in the field on our site. 
Any luck with the audio? Getting Carol and Bill connected? All right. We could always have um, have Carol and Bill talk a little bit once their audio gets queued up. Maybe we can have um, have them uh, speak a little at the end once their audio is is uh, is working, unless it's working now. Is that you, Carol? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you absolutely. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Um, I'm having trouble on our computer um, trying to get the audio, so I'm actually on the iPhone. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So anyway, um, the pictures I sent, we planted in, um, actually planted those plants, all of them, all the squash on the 18th of um, May. And um, it, it's amazing how how quickly the only problems that we, I mean, they as your plants did in Corvallis, ours did the same. They just spread out, and we had one one plant, um, you know, three three plants of each each variety, and um, basically they all kind of fused by the end of the season, even though they were separated by you know, five seven feet. So. Um, anyway, and you can see, as you see the pictures there, um, I think that's in July sometime, but it's, um, so right now, actually, when you go out to look at those plants, they're just barely yellowing, um, and the, there's still flowers, of course, on, on the plants, but some of them are, I mean, the, the squash isn't developed yet to harvest. I suspect that it won't be until probably the end of September or into October. But you can see the one squash on the right side there. Um, that is a honey boat and um, looks pretty good, actually. And this has been a, I mean, they, these plants, once they got in the ground, they haven't had a single bit of water and they're amazing. And of course, we had that moisture, um, rain and et cetera. So it's been really exciting. I mean, it, those um other than cucumber beetles, and now um, basically we're having a little bit of powdery mildew on some of the uh, squash plants, and, um, but otherwise they look they still look very healthy. Great. And Carol, did you um, uh, transplant your squash on May 18th or direct seed? That was transplanted. Mm -hmm. We had trouble with uh, honey boat. Um, getting it germinated the first time around mm -hmm. and um, and you sent me some extra seeds and they germinated fine and they were actually put, you know, even though I um, germinated them late, they were actually put in the ground at the same time as the other um, Zeppelin and um, the other squash and they did, they, you know, they did fine. So they all, all the squash plants caught up with each other and basically grew about the same. Great. And Carol, have you um, inputted some of your data or notes on germination in the Seedlink platform already? I did, um, and I have to go back in. I did initially put in when we transplanted and I haven't actually put in any other information other than that. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I'll go, yeah. I'll, I'll go back and, and do that. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share with us your results and join us today. And maybe uh, if you're around at the end and there's any questions that come up, maybe um, you could join our question and answer session if you have time. Okay, thanks, Amy. Great, thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. All right, and another um, participant that uh, shared some results with us actually yesterday uh, is Emily Cooper. So she harvested a couple days ago and she's with Full Cellar Farm just um, east of Portland. So in the Portland area, I believe she's now located at the Headwaters Farm, which is in East Multnomah County. And 
So the picture down at the bottom is, a, is, is the harvest from a single plot um, of honey boat, candy stick, and zeppelin. And she did three plots of each. So I, um, she emailed me her data and I kind of compiled it in this little table here for us to look at. So this is just one site so far, um, but this is looking at three reps uh, of honey boat. Um, so that's three plants in each rep. Uh, so the average number of fruit here we have uh, ranging from 17 to 26 and the minimum yield for each variety. So there was differences in those um, three plots of each variety. Um, so this is the lowest yield of those three plots. So ranging from 12 to 19 and then the maximum yield for her three plots was uh, ranging from 25 to 29. So the highest yielding one was a uh, highest yielding plot for her was a honey boat um, delicata plot. And it looks like she had a slightly, so we got about 23 pounds on average. So that was averaged across her three plots, um, 23 pounds for three plants. So if you divide that by three, you could get a per plant yield. So that'd be a little, um, gosh, my math brain isn't working right now, but uh, if you divide those average yield numbers by three, the candy stick would be about six pounds per plant. Um, but uh, so that's just some preliminary data. So this is the kind of data that we're going to be compiling across sites along with that, those qual the qualitative data that we're getting from uh, folks on Seedlinked. And thank you, Carol, uh, Bill, and Emily for sharing your data ahead of time. I know it's a busy time of year for folks and there's a lot going on. So I really appreciate that because we learn way more together than um, on our own. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to um, my colleague, Lucas Niebert, who's been collaborating on these variety trials for the past few years. And um, I'll hand it off to you, Lucas, thank you. Thanks, Amy. Hi, I'm Lucas. I. Uh, did more of the coordinating on the Maximus squash trial this year, so I'll just be filling in a few more details uh, about it. And so we chose three different varieties for the Maximus squash trial. Silver Bell, which is from Restoration Seeds, Stella Blue from Seed Revolution Now, and we had also grown that in previous years, and so we used our saved seed from that. So we've been continuing uh, dry farm selection of, of Stella Blue. And then uh, Tetsu Kabuto from Johnny Seeds. Um, and we should note that Tetsu Kabuto is an interesting, unique variety. is actually an F1 hybrid interspecies cross between uh, Cucurbita maxima and Cucurbita machata. Um, so it's a little bit outside the boundary of a maxima, but um, we thought it had such interesting results with uh, Stone and Wetzel's study. We should include it. Um, we had also wanted to include crown variety, uh, but that one is, the seeds are really hard to find right now. Um, and we're hoping they're available next year. And you might note earlier that Silver Bell was a top performer in the Stone and Wetzel study as well in dry farm uh, conditions and it stored really well. Um, Stone and Wetzel had not tried Stella Blue, so we wanted to include that as a reference because we've been we've been having good results with Stella Blue, and we, um, yeah, can you can you continue the next slide? Yeah, so for the uh, 2020 Maximus Squash Trial, we trialed it. the The main trial site that we used was the OSU Vegetable Research Farm, uh, but then we also had 10 participants uh, using Seedlinked. Um, so we'll be, we'll be getting some community source data from that as well. And uniquely, we also did a dry farm irrigated comparison at the vegetable research farm. So we got the plants in a little bit late, June 1st. Uh, some of it was direct seeded and some of it was transplanted. We're gonna compare and see, see how they, the different, uh, how they fare differently. The directs, the Maxima seem to do fairly well direct seeded compared to the Delicatas. 
Um, just to note that our irrigation treatment was about an inch and a half per week, June through July, and then one two inch watering in mid August, overhead irrigation. And so you can see on August 6th, these are our plants. On the left, we have the dry farm uh, plants, and on the right, we have irrigated. It's pretty clear to um, see the differences there. The leaves are bigger, the plants are bigger. And yeah, let's advance to the next slide. So September 14th, last week, um, we would be starting to harvest these, but um, this is an example of how, how they're doing in the field. Um, they're starting to yellow, dry down a bit. And yeah, Stella Blue on the left, Tetsukabuto in the middle, Silver Bell on the right. And yeah, let's advance to the next slide. And that's compared to the irrigated plants. Um, the irrigated ones, they're getting, um, you know, more powder, powdery mildew and starting to die back. Um, and generally seem to be producing more yields. On the right hand side, we also have Zeppelin delicata. So we were able to do irrigated comparisons of the delicata squash as well, just to, yeah, keep on trying to produce data um, solid numbers to show how dry farming yield compares with irrigated yield. All right, let's go to the next slide. And so this is a figure from the Stone and Wetzel study. This is uh, Jennifer Wetzel's master's thesis. And uh, it's a summary of the average yields of all their 16 squash varieties, um, irrigated versus dry land. 2016 at OSU and then two different sites in 2017, um, OSU and WO, I don't, I don't know where that is, but um, uh, if you, uh, Amy, if you click the button one more time, then we'll get the percent difference. Yeah, so basically the percent, the dry farm yield as a percent of the irrigated yield um, differs, you know, substantially by year and site. And so it's hard to say categorically like what it's gonna, what the, how they're gonna compare in any given year and location. It depends on how mild the year is. Um, I can say that in 2017, that it was kind of a, a rough year. It was, there was a lot of hot days. Um, you know, 2016 was milder. So, you know, the squash seem to really, the dry farm squash seem to really respond to, um, you know, days above, you know, 90 degrees of heat. So, yeah, we're just trying to add more uh, data points to this. So, yeah, let's co continue the next slide. And this is just a couple, a little bit of a summary from the dry farm group. Uh, trials doing dry farm versus irrigated um, Stella Blue squash. And so this is from 2019, last year, which was a fairly mild year. And you see on the bar graph on the left, we have uh, yield per acre of uh, dry farmed and irrigated squash. And then we also played with the spacing a little bit, and we see that the spacing didn't really make a big difference. The plants were able to fill in um, at wider spacing. Um, but uh, we had Stella Blue Dry Farm producing 89% of irrigated yield, so uh, fairly close comparison. And to consider that potentially it stores better dry farmed, it's, uh, yeah, definitely makes it a uh, a, a worthwhile endeavor to try to dry farm this. And then on the right side, we have uh, moisture sensor readings where we essentially put uh, moisture sensors at one foot in the red, two foot in the green, three foot in the blue, and four foot in the purple down into the ground. Um, and so, and what you're seeing is graphs through time throughout the growing season. And the 
the uh, the top three graphs are dry farmed. The bottom three graphs are irrigated. We have beans, corn, and squash. And you know, if you look at the squash, you can see basically when the root zone gets to the moisture sensors, it starts uh, wicking away all the water. And you can see, you know, in you know by late July, early August, it's starting to get down to four feet in the squash, whereas in the corn beans, well, in the corn it didn't have, uh, the corn did not get there. And of course the beans didn't, we didn't measure it at four feet. But um, yeah, that just goes to show you that squash is, uh, has a lot of potential for dry farming because the roots uh, really travel on the ground, you know, as above, so below the, the squash um, vines travel great distances and so do the roots. And yeah, that's about all I have to say about the dry farm uh, uh, Maxima variety trial. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lucas. Yeah. And um, let's see, Brad or Maricos, would you mind helping to uh, read off questions um, that have not been addressed yet? Sure. Um, it looks like we have a question from Susan. Uh, how does dry versus irrigated, uh, how does it work with powdery mildew? Is there a difference uh, there? All right. Um, and then also, uh, if Carol, if you're still with us, maybe um, we could uh, unmute Carol and allow her to, if she has anything to offer uh, for these questions, um, she can feel free to do so as well. Um, I know that I've, um, Alex Stone has worked a lot with us. We've mentioned her in this presentation today and, and she's worked a lot with winter squash. And I know that um, in a lot of squash is uh, overhead irrigated around here and apparently that helps with powdery mildew which is kind of counterintuitive. I'm not a plant pathologist but I have always thought of um, uh, irrigation as exas exacerbating a lot of pest problems and disease problems by like splashing spores on a leaf which provides a hospitable environment for things but I thought it was interesting that Alex informed me that uh, overhead irrigation actually helps uh, helps with powdery mildew, mildew by washing those spores off of um, off the plant leaves. Um, does anybody else, uh, Lucas or uh, Carol, have anything to offer on um, powdery mildew and dry versus irrigated squash? Um, Amy, in in uh, Jenny and Alex's paper, she said that crown seemed like it was particularly susceptible um, in the irrigated versus the dry land production, and they actually saw an increase in yield size in the dry land uh, mm -hmm. dry farmed crown variety. So that's that's the only thing that I can see that alluded to that comparison with the powdery mildew. Great, thank you for sharing that, Cassandra. That's a good point. You know, while there's the management things in the field that might affect uh, or worsen powdery mildew, there's also the variety, like the susceptibility of the variety. So crown isn't one that we grew this year, but uh, as Cassandra just noted, Alex did include that in their, um, in their research. So yeah, maybe if you have problems with powdery mildew, you could try that variety in your plot. Um, just another note here, Brad has shared that we have an evaluation uh, for each of these field tours. So if they, it only takes really like two or three minutes to fill out. So if you have time um, to fill one of those out, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, Maricos, are there other questions that we have um, in the box that we could help answer? Um, there was a question about whether we used overhead or, ir or drip irrigation and Brad answered that we uh, at the DFC this season have been using overhead. Um, perhaps other people in the trial have been using uh, drip if, if they uh, are doing a comparison of dry farmed with irrigated. Yeah. Um. I don't know what different people's experience with the different irrigation types have been, but because squash roots can travel so far um, laterally that uh, drip irrigation might not 
benefit the squash as much as um, overhead in that sense um, because overhead covers more area. But that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, we just did overhead. One of the other questions that came through um, was, do you have any records on varieties that indigenous people use to dry farm? So um, Hidatsa is one of the varieties um, and that I I think has roots uh, in, in, our, in our indigenous communities. And um, that is, uh, I would love to experiment with more varieties that have, um, have a history of being dry farmed. So if anybody on this call have recommendations, uh, we are always looking for more recommendations uh, for varieties. It looks like there's an interesting comment here from Carolina. Um, she said, uh, back to the powdery mildew, uh, that they've had good results applying milk whey at 1% in water to control mildew and pumpkin and peas. That's an interesting, I've never tried that. Thank you for that, Carolina. Yeah, I'm curious how you came up with that as a treatment. Um, if, I don't know, maybe we could try unmuting Carolina and she could share a little bit about that. Uh, are there any other questions while we're waiting to see if the audio will work for Carolina? I know that she's actually um, in Brazil, I think. So um, if that works, that'd be awesome. Hey, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hello. So, yeah, we've, we use this milkway for a long time here. I don't know if it's uh, if we have any studies on it, but it really works. I mix it at one percent with water and spray on the plants, so the mildew actually eats the whey instead of the leaves. <laughs> it's pretty much how it works. So I'll try to find a study here with um, English translations, and if I do, I'll send it to you, Amy. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, any other questions that we have here, Maricos? We had one more question from Susan. Uh, Lucas stated that dry farmed Maxima stored better. Do we think it's because of the variety or does dry farming lead to better storage? Sounds like both. Um, yeah, so the the series of three bar graphs that Amy showed kind of addresses this question. Um, it was there were different species you, of of uh, cucurbita that were trialed, and it seems to be kind of like uh, like overall dry farming seemed to improve improve the storage. If you can think about it, just in terms of water, when when there's more water in in uh, with respect to like sugars in the fruit, then the mold can take over a little more easily. Um, there's also the tendency for a fusarium, um, which is a top storage rot fungus, to get in through the blossom when you're when you're irrigating uh, more. So that's more likely to happen in, during irrigation. But it is really do, that graph made it seem like it was a very variety by variety um, case. So certain varieties, um, we don't see a big difference of dry farming and other ones we see a really big difference. So um, yeah, I think it's just requires more testing and you can't ever really generalize. Great, thank you, Lucas. Um... Let's see, I, I, I can see there's a, a question from Deborah, and she's asking if we're going to store all the harvest from this, this year and share data on storage later next year. And yeah, that, um, that is definitely my plan with uh, Delicata and um, 
I'm sure Lucas and I will put it, put aside some subsamples and we've done this with other crops in the past, like last year with the potatoes. Uh, we looked a few months, a couple months after, I think a December sampling and see what was left. And then we sampled again, I think in February. So uh, ideally, I think we would do like a monthly sampling to see how some of the, how these different varieties are storing. So yes, we will report back and uh, yeah, we're probably going to try to donate or get the produce left over from our project uh, in the hands of people that need it right now, but we'll put a subsample, maybe like a, you know, uh, 20 uh, or 30 squash in a box to see just how they, how they store over time. And we will report back, Deborah. Any other kind of questions or comments? Um, I want to note, uh, there's been a couple questions in the chat box. This is being recorded and we will be archiving this on the website uh, that's been shared in the chat box. And it's also here on this page, uh, the smallfarms.oregonstate.edu slash dry farming. So this is where everything will be housed. And if you know somebody that wasn't able to attend today that would like to, that'd be a great place to direct them to. Uh, also, the Dry Farming Collaborative Facebook group is um, uh, another great way to like join the conversation if you are on Facebook, and we will be looking for ways, um, kind of a more universal platform for discussion in the future, and that's something that the Dry Farming Institute is interested in helping to create. So, um, yeah, feel free to reach out with any questions uh, or join us on the Facebook group. All right, thank you everybody and take take good care. I know, uh, yeah, there are people still recovering from the wildfires that have been happening and um, I'm hoping for blue sky and uh, fresh air soon. So take good care.